it's, it's great being here. Um, what I wanted to do is to share in the next few minutes um, some ideas taken from really quite distant episodes in the past. Because it seems to me that there's a, an assumption that was often made when the euro was uh, instituted uh, that this was a kind of vast and novel experiment in building a non-national money in exactly this decoupling of the central bank from the state um, and that there couldn't really, as a result, be any useful historical analogies to this. Um, I think that's not really true and I want to treat history as a kind of vast laboratory that you can really draw some quite interesting things about in regard to two aspects in particular. Uh, first of all, in regard to the need for fiscal rules. And secondly, also in regard to the question of, of flexibility in the implementation of monetary policy. <laughs> when EMU was discussed in the 1970s and 80s, it stood for economic and monetary union. But the, the technical aspects of this went well ahead of the political initiatives on European integration. And as a result, there was a very imperfect agreement on crucial aspects of the monetary union, in particular regarding fiscal rules and also regarding banking supervision and regulation, and also then the clear possible fiscal consequences of what happens when banking supervision fails and you need a fiscal bailout. Why these were treated with uh, such caution was that both raised critical issues about the potential loss of national sovereignty and also about the redistribution of consequences of Europeanizing a fundamental part of economic policy making. You can see this incompleteness in some of the discussions that took place when the monetary union was being made. It appears, for instance, very nicely in the linguistic discussion of what the objectives of the European system of central banks are, spelled out in Article 2. Um, the first draft for this uh, said appropriately, and very much in the spirit of Chris Sims, uh, that there should be support for the general economic policy of the community. But then people noticed that the community didn't really have a general economic policy. Um, and so instead, it was general economic policies and not of the community, but in the community. Uh, so the, uh, there was a big retreat from something that originally had been quite logical. Now, if you think about this uh, in the context of the country that we're standing in, there's a quite obvious analogy in that at first, for instance, people in the uh, time after 1776 found it very difficult to speak of the United States in the singular. Uh, it, it, so they were grammatically correct and said the United States are doing something or other. And it's only in the middle of the 19th century that people made the transition to saying that the United States is a country. Um, so, this is the uh, reason for thinking about uh, the euro with, with some degree of worry, the imperfect realization of the fiscal concomitants of monetary union. And then, secondly, I think, uh, there's a story about excessive trust in the integration of the capital market, and as a consequence, inadequate flexibility in monetary policy in both of those areas. I want to think about in terms of the possible rules that we could take from history. Um, first of all, then, uh, rules about federal finance. Alexander Hamilton has become, for many people, a hero in contemporary Europe. And I have a kind of fantasy that one day the euro note will be redesigned and Alexander Hamilton's <laughs> face will be <laughs> on the euro note. In particular, the negotiation in 1790 of the federal assumption of the high state debts that had been accumulated in the aftermath of the War of Independence looks like a wonderfully tempting model for European states groaning under 
unbearable debt burdens, and it was cited, um, for instance, uh, as a precedent in Thomas Sargent's Nobel Prize acceptance speech. It's important to notice here something about this, that the states that made up the United States, I don't think can really be blamed for the poor fiscal performance. That's the responsibility, a consequence of the external circumstances of the war for independence. And if you want to make this analogy, I think you need to make the argument that at least some of the European debt problems are not the consequence of intrinsically bad national fiscal policies, but come instead from a global financial crisis, and that can be made as a good argument, particularly for Spain or for Ireland. Um, there were two sides to Hamilton's argument about why the debt uh, the state debt should be assumed by the Federation, two sides of that argument, one practical and one philosophical. It was the practical one that appealed most, which was that it would dramatically lower the cost of state borrowing. In other words, that's something that appeals to Europeans at the moment as well. Um, in the 18th century context, you could lower the cost of borrowing from 6% to around 4%, Hamilton calculated, through the assumption. Um, but there's also, I think, a very powerful <coughs> philosophical element to this, um, and it's in, in the case of uh, building a, a, a true federation, and uh, Hamilton really stressed that much more, uh, calling the assumption the powerful cement of our union. Now, th this uh, approach rested as a condition for its success on the capacity of the Union to raise its own revenue through federally administered customs houses. I think, and that's also been spelt out uh, perfectly, that the same kind of logic would apply in modern Europe, where if you had a euro bond, it would require some kind of fiscal revenue, perhaps something as simple as a common administration of customs or of part of the value-added tax. In both cases, you can also think of additional benefits in the form of eliminating a great deal of cross-border fraud. But it's also worth thinking about the concomitance of that assumption. There was a political negotiation that took place. Some states didn't like the idea of Virginia, of, of, of the assumption. Virginia um, was politically very powerful. Uh, but didn't have much of a debt that needed to be assumed, and so it re was rewarded by a ceiling on its potential liability. It's only when that inducement was added that Madison dropped his opposition and agreed to the proposal, as well as the well-known link that associated this with the move of the cabinet to the new site in Washington. In some states, actually, uh, Georgia, for instance, just opted out of the assumption process altogether. <coughs> It's also important to say that this Hamilton moment wasn't initially completely successful. Important parts were left unfinished. Hamilton envisaged this also in terms of a reform of the banking law with joint stock banks, but that didn't really occur. He wanted a national bank of issue, uh, but that was limited, um, and then in the 1830s, the Jacksonians to stop that happening. The states overborrowed, and after the late 1830s, there were waves of federal defaults, of, of, of state defaults. Um, so, although Hamilton looks very attractive, the measure of assuming debt isn't simply by itself a guarantor of success. What really is crucial is the philosophical element of the Hamilton story, making the assumption the common cement of our union. Um, and that's, I think, a move that Europeans are probably unwilling to do unless they're faced with an absolutely gigantic crisis. Um, and the risk that is involved in all of this is that the crisis is so great that it reduces any capacity to make the transition that the Hamiltonian uh, uh, move would really require. <clears throat>
So I wanted also um, to think about some other ways in which the system uh, could be adapted. Um, a common criticism of monetary union is that it required a single monetary policy and thus became a kind of one size fits all, depriving policymakers of a policy tool in responding to particular national or regional circumstances. At the beginning, there was a complete consensus on the idea that monetary policy was indivisible and needed to be centralized, that there could only be one policy in a monetary union. Um, and I think most of us have accepted that logic as absolutely irrefutably uh, binding. Um, but actually, that's not the lesson from historical episodes from quite a way ago. Uh, think, for instance, of the gold standard. And people, many people make parallels to the gold standard with the story of the European Monetary Union because, like with the gold standard, you're really surrendering um, a particular uh, instrument and exchange rate uh, tool. Um, what happens in the gold standard? Um, one of the criticisms of the, this, this gold standard uh, monetary union analogy uh, follows in the sense that uh, people say that the gold standard had um, an inherent deflationary uh, for pressure following from the peculiarity of the adjustment mechanism. Um, but that, that really was a feature of the particular monetary circumstances for the gold dependence. You don't need to do that in a world in which you have an inflation targeting central bank. Um, but the, there's another lesson from the gold standard. It concerns the extent and the limits of capital market integration. In the early 90s, policymakers and market participants we're thinking about the European Community's 1992 program, a legislative framework for a single market and for a single capital market that re would require a new reality, and then they thought the single currency would work its magic within that. Following from that, there followed the obligation by the new authority to treat all types of risk in the monetary union, bank risk or government risk, as identical. But actually, the history of the gold standard is very, very different. Despite the theoretical possibility of capital being sent over vast distances to other parts of the world, much capital remained local. Creditors and banks preferred to do business with known borrowers in local jurisdictions where the legal circumstances were clear. And if you look at uh, the discount rates of the gold standard era, um, the central bank rates, you can see that there wasn't a single uh, central bank rate, that there's a considerable degree of divergence. It's sometimes as little as 0.5 percent, but it, it, it can go uh, much, much higher than that. This is just the UK, Germany, and France, which were relatively close to each other. If you put outliers in the uh, gold standard in, like Italy, uh, you will see much higher rates consistently in Italy uh, than in Germany, um, and much, much higher rates than in the UK and France, in the UK and France provided a kind of base uh, for, uh, for this. Um, but surprisingly, you can see exactly the same sort of story in the early years of the uh, Federal Reserve's history. Um, the Federal Reserve banks, the different banks, I've just put in four banks, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, San Francisco, uh, in this figure uh, to, to show how this works. You can see they're closer than they are in the gold standard uh, world, but that's not surprising that they're closer. But each Federal Reserve Bank could set its own rate. The only limitation was that under Section 14B of the 1913 Act, the Federal Reserve Act, the rates were subject to review and determination by the Federal Reserve Board. And in some circumstances, in particular during the Great Depression, the Federal Reserve Board intervened uh, to force adjustments by a particular uh, reserve bank. Um, but you can see, I think, what happens in this. In normal times, the rates are very, very close to each other. Uh, but it's in critical moments, um, at times of shocks, that they move apart and they reflect differ differences in local circumstances. 
Um, for instance, in the summer of 1929, at the height of the credit boom, New York tightened its rates, while the other banks left their rates unchanged. Or in 1932, um, at, the, uh, at the height of the recession, the Depression, uh, New York went much faster and further and pushed uh, much more effectively for lowering rates than did other banks. Now, is modern Europe a really single capital market in the deeper sense than that of 19th century uh, Europe when there were also no formal capital controls between European countries? Um, as a simple test of that, I think you can look at the amount of government debt that's held in individual countries. Up to the 1990s, this was very much a national story. With the 1990s and the move to European Monetary Union, debt becomes more and more internationalized. Uh, a lot of debt is held outside the countries which issued the debt. Uh, but in the aftermath of the crisis, and particularly in the aftermath of the Litro operations, debt is being renationalized, and so we're getting back to something like uh, the, the older uh, pre-monetary union world. Uh, recently, the German economics minister, Philipp Rössler, uh, made the fascinating suggestion that members of the European system of central banks, members of the Eurozone, should set their own interest rates. The, there should be different uh, central bank rates in different countries. Um, and if you think about it, uh, then you might meet some of the problems of the one-size-fit-all uh, 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 framework that had originally been set. Autonomous interest rate determination would, for instance, have allowed banks in countries with a credit boom to tighten rates, um, and uh, banks where there's no credit boom to relax rates. You could have borrowed, if you were a commercial bank, from a low interest rate uh, bank, but then you would have, have had to take on the risk in doing this. Um, there are, I think, also signs that people are moving in this direction, that individual central banks are using the leeway that they have, even in the existing policy framework, to carry out important policy shifts. The Bundesbank, for instance, recently stated that it won't accept bank securities as collateral from banks that <coughs> have undergone a government reca uh, recapitalization. These new collateral requirements, together with at least a tentative talk of autonomous interest rates, really represent a remarkable incipient in innovation. In the aftermath of the crisis, policymakers are beginning to see that a monetary union isn't necessarily identical with completely unfettered capital mobility. There are still limits on the way in which capital moves. And that recognition of diverse credit quality is a step back into the 19th century world, and at the same time, a step forward to a more market-oriented and less distorting uh, approach to policy. Finally, I wanted to think of um, <clears throat> other possible lessons from history, um, other moments when previous crises seem to produce innovative solutions. The immediate aftermath of the Maastricht Treaty um, holds out some really instructive lessons for the present because at that time the European monetary system was shaken by a series of crises between September 92 and July 93, which looked as if they were really going to blow up the whole course of European integration. What started off was a, it was a, looked as if it was first a one country problem, um, in the same way as for some time people thought it was just a Greek problem. And then they saw that that one country was just at the beginning of a kind of domino process that might go on uh, to destroy the whole system, and there were a whole series of dominoes that fell between <coughs> September 1992 and July 1993. Britain followed very quickly after Italy, then Spain, then Portugal, and by July 1993, even France had begun to be vulnerable, and the whole future of the European project was at stake. And uh, in the crisis meetings that took place at, right at the end of July 1993, many people were really very, very pessimistic and didn't believe that the exchange rate mechanism could be 
adjusted uh, to get any kind of uh, viable, viable solution. Um, and uh, the very, very last minute, um, there was a solution which was to move to greater flexibility. The bands in the European monetary system were widened to 15% either way of the central rate. And at first, the result was it seemed that the single currency uh, was a long, long way off. Um, the French franc initially fell very sharply against the Deutsche Mark. You can see the fall in the immediate aftermath of that uh, widening of the bands. Um, and it looked as if it was going way out of the, out of the bands, um, uh, the narrow bands that had existed up to the summer of 93. Um, and then there's a further round of instability associated with a presidential election uh, a year later. Um, but in the end, you can see that the French franc relative to the Deutsche Mark returned to very much what it had been before the crisis. So it, it seemed to indicate that the whole crisis was really a kind of illusionary affair, but that this momentary adoption of an additional measure of flexibility was an important part of getting away out of the crisis. Um, so I, I wonder uh, whether people think of anything like this that would be analogous to the wider bands. Is there a kind of way out that would give you flexibility for a little time uh, and maybe return uh, to the normal path uh, after the end of the crisis episode? Um, well, um, uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's hard to think of it, but then I thought you really need to go back a very, very long way in time. Um, these are Florentine coins uh, from the late Middle Ages. The, on the left side, the um, picciolo, the little silver coin, and on the right-hand side, the gold coin. Um, and the story is that until the 1870s, Europe operated for centuries with a bimetallic standard, uh, with gold and silver. Each metal had their own coinage, and they were used for different things. Um, high value gold coins were used as a reference point, a measure for large value transactions and for all international business, whereas low value silver coins were used for day to day transactions and for the payment of wages and rents. In other words, silver was you know, it's famously uh, addressed in The Merchant of Venice um, when uh, Shakespeare describes silver as the pale and common drudge twixt man and man. Um, but what that does is to give some flexibility in it. So the wages are set in silver, but the prices of the internationally traded goods are uh, set in terms of gold. Um, people have looked at this for the Netherlands in the 17th century and also seen exactly the same operation of gold and silver as a way of providing a flexible exchange rate in terms of the management of the difference between the silver and the gold coinage. They're a shock absorber that protects the gold, uh, that protects the domestic economy. Um, so what would that look like in the modern setting? Um, well, the result, uh, if you try to think of something like this, would be saying it might be possible in some circumstances to imagine countries introducing a national coinage or a revived national coinage that was functional equivalent of silver, that wages would be paid in silver, um, and it would probably then be traded at a discount, while the euro would be the equivalent of the gold standard for the international transactions and would be kept stable by those institutions which already exist today, the European Central Bank. In that sense, the the gold equivalent, the euro, the central bank that keeps it up, the countries that just have the gold coinage, would be like Britain in the gold standard world. Because unlike most continental European countries, Britain never had a gold and silver standard. It had a pure gold standard uh, approach. Um, and the silver coinage was just token coinage. Um, so the core countries would look like <coughs> the 18th and early 19th century equivalents of Britain with no bimetallic standard, but the peripheral countries would look like Florence in the Middle Ages or Amsterdam in the 17th century, which were, after all, extremely successful 
uh, economies and adaptive economies. Why were they so adaptive? Because they had this, this, this buffer built in by the exchange rate between gold and silver. You can think of it another way, I think, uh, which is to think of that exercise as dispersing risk that at the moment is concentrated very heavily in the balance sheet of the ECB and in the national central banks uh, to individuals and to firms in the, in the member countries which would have the double exchange rate. So um, this uh, very, very remote bit of history from these apparently archaeological coins um, seems to me to be actually not a bad way of thinking about a way of possibly introducing a greater element of stability because of risk diversification in a situation uh, which at the moment is unbelievably precarious. And thank you.